Hi, good afternoon and welcome to the Deerfield uh, Select Board Board of Health meeting for August 19th, 2020. Uh, we're starting a little bit late due to technical difficulties, um, common occurrence, which is 5.10 uh, uh, p.m. Um, let's see, so I'll, I'll just, we're meeting in the main meeting room at municipal offices at 8 Conway Street, South Deerfield, Mass. Meetings normally held at the municipal offices are being held remotely with adequate alternative means of public access and where required particip uh, public participation provided in accordance with the governor's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, Mass General Law um, Chapter 30A, Section 20, uh, broadcast on Frontier Community Access Television, FCAP, uh, remote meeting connections uh, noted below. Sounds like we have Carolyn. Um, so you can join the meeting uh, on our link. If you go to our homepage, you can look at our agenda and click on the link for Zoom. I'm not gonna read all those letters and numbers. Or you can call in, um, you can dial in 1-312-626-6799. And then our meeting ID is 952-2899-6363. And then you'll be prompted for the passcode, which is 127247. Um, you can also, uh, you know, there's a bunch of telephone numbers depending on where you are. You can get a, you, you can use a 1-800 number. There's all different ways to, to sign in, or you can just sign in, you know, using your laptop or, you know, mobile device using the, Zo the Zoom app. So um, meeting attendees should mute their phones. You can star six for landlines unless asking a question or commenting. Um, that, that mute your phone and also unmute your phone if you want to ask a question. All attendees should wait uh, to speak until other participants are finished. There's usually a lot of lag with these meetings, so just wait till people are done and then just state who you are and speak clearly. And um, so our agenda today, I call this meeting to order. I'm gonna chair the meeting tonight. Uh, uh, Dave is here and Carolyn's on the line and Casey's remote and we have other people remote. So um, I'll call the meeting to order. Uh, we have no hearings or appearances today. Um, we're really here, we just wanted to meet, this wasn't a typical night for our meeting, but we wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, our, our reopening plans and some COVID updates and different policies, personnel policies as they relate to COVID-19. And I know Casey will fill us in on a, on a bit of that. Um, are there any select board, you know, announcements or board of health announcements right off the bat? Or do you want to just get into the, well, the items or go ahead, go ahead, Dave. I think, um, Oh, thank you. Passed, yes. Um, who has been a great asset to the town. Uh, and you know, even if he disagreed with people, he always listened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's public servants like that that help this town grow the way it has grown. So, uh, reaching out to his family, I know there's no uh, services scheduled for him, but um, we wish the family the best and, and our sincere condolences on his passing. Yeah, thank you. I know that um, there was a, a mention in the obituary that if people wanted to donate in honor of him to the, um, Frank, the, the hospice, local hospice, that would be uh, greatly appreciated. Um, Bruce was an amazing talent. Um, he had many, many years in public service, working for the FERCOG and um, managing large projects. And um, he just had a way with understanding how larger projects would happen. And uh, he served many years on our, on our finance committee and, and was on our uh, building advisory committee, chairing that with, or co-chairing that with Julie Chalfont. Um, it was a shock to, to see that in the paper and we're, we're all very sorry. And, Again, we offer our condolences to his family and we really appreciate every bit of uh, service he gave to the town on many different aspects uh, that we worked on. So um, let's see. A couple other things just to hit on real quick is, you know, I, I've been watching. Excuse me, Trevor, I just, I just want to add that oh, um, we're going to really miss his expertise. Yes. He, he was helping us on the building committee so much. Yep. And, um, it was really really important he, he did he had a way to understand large projects to make them a little simpler and you know he really knew how to deal with you know with all the different aspects of engineering and 
you know, how, how, to, how to manage a big project like that. He had had so much experience and we're, we're definitely at a loss without him, for sure. Um, I just wanted to hit on real quick the, uh, we have a, we've um, installed the large Dropbox out front in the lobby. Um, a lot of people are, are asking about ballots. So for a special election is coming up on the um, September 1st uh, for the primary, for in-state primary for, you know, House and Senate. Um, and so, you know, originally we had the smaller uh, drop box attached to the police department wall when you first came into the right. Um, and that could handle ballots, but we, we assume that we'll be getting a lot more ballots. So um, it's taken us a little while because we keep getting them in damage, but we finally have in our large, um, installed our large drop box, which could handle all of, uh, probably all of the ballots at once. It's pretty large. So. Um, and that's right when you come in the door and there's signage there. And so anybody that wants to, that has asked for a mail-in ballot, has filled it out, um, wants to come and drop it off. Uh, we know that Saturday and uh, Sunday will start the in-person early voting for that primary. And uh, there'll be some times the following week and the following weekend, but um, you can always drop it off, you know, just fill it out. You can mail it in if you want to mail it in, but if you're concerned about how long it would take in the mail and you want to be sure that it gets to us, you're more than welcome to drive down and walk in the front lobby there and, and you'll see the giant box. You can just drop it right in there. It has a ballot sign on it and um, so ready to go there. That's all set uh, for you. So. Um, so I get really the main, the main issue today was to talk a little bit about our reopening plans as they relate to COVID. We have, I have a select board meeting. We're, I think we're all gonna stay here for, or most of us are gonna stay here for at seven o'clock tonight. Uh, is it school committee meeting, sorry, at um, seven o'clock. And um, you know, that plan, the reopening plan evolves on that as we negotiate with the staff and um, try to think about holidays and who, who's coming back and what do we have for testing and making sure we have all the security in place. And um, so, so that, that's been a evolving rolling target. And um, we think that's probably gonna um, roll out a little slower than we were thinking in the beginning, but it's all for the safety of our, of our staff and, and our children. So it's understandable. And Darius is doing a great job with his staff. They're all doing an amazing job trying to get, you know, get that plan up and running for remote and for hybrid. Um, so, We'll have some more information about that and some finance stuff on, on the school, uh, Deerfield Elementary. I think Frontier was last night, Waitley's was the night before, and there were some other, other nights uh, were the other towns. Um, so really this kind of ties in a little bit with that and ties in with our open, opening for, um, for early voting, you know, uh, the elections. We, by law, we need to be open to allow people to come in and have free access to their polls. And so uh, we've developed, Barb has developed a plan and working with Casey and the department heads and how we're gonna do that and how we're gonna handle, um, you know, keeping the town safe, the building safe and the traffic flow. And um, so I, I think maybe I would turn it over to Casey to maybe just fill us in a bit on where you're at with that. And um, I know you've given us a plan to look over and do you wanna, do you wanna hit on the highlights of that, Casey? Sure. Okay. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen, oh, nice. which is kind of messy because I downloaded a lot of stuff today. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, I hope. Ah, it's not letting me do it. For some reason, it won't let me do it. Oh, maybe. There it is. Can you see it? Yep. Yep. There it is. All right, so what we did, and I had worked with Dick on this for quite a bit, and basically there were a couple of elements that we needed to cover. And because COVID has, is continuing to evolve and it's, we have to deal with employment issues, um, folks at home have issues that they need us to be aware of, so that are employees. And we wanna make the public aware of how we're handling things right now. So we created this plan and I have to say one of my colleagues, um, a very nice person from Lexington shared his plan and I used his as a baseline and um, made, made some changes, you know, added some stuff, refined the appendices, which include policies and, and will include other plans for other departments and programs. But 
really created, um, I think, a working document. Mm -hmm. And so I'll start at the top. The purpose is to, we recognize that employees coming back to the workplace in this situation face unusual circumstances, and so do visitors. So we have to be careful to protect the public health and safety. Um, I reference the reopening phases in Massachusetts. And right now we're in phase three, step one, I think, Carolyn. Um, and then I tell everybody to check through the state's coronavirus website. And at the end of the main section of the plan, there's references to links that people can use to find that information. Karen, or Carolyn, can you mute yourself? Oh, maybe it's not you. Maybe it's somebody else. Somebody needs to mute themselves. <laughs> Star six. Okay. All right. So we go through definitions first, and that's yep. hand washing, symptom, symptom check. You are muted. You can mute or um, unmute yourself by pressing star six. I had to six. mute them. I'm sorry. Sorry. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm unmuted. I mean, I was muted. Yes, you're now. muted. I'm unmuted now. Yep. Right? Okay. Yep. So basically we go through a series of definitions. What does it mean to do this? Be vigilant for symptoms. What is social distancing? What is hand washing? Um, face covering, use of gloves, and there are exceptions to face covering. So we, we note that very briefly. Um, and this is basically for the municipal offices and regular programming that we pushed out or connected with people um, in the office, the main office, the police department, South County EMS, recreation department, libraries, senior center, they all have different protocols and different requirements. So I'm going to ask them to do separate plans so that they can identify those specific things that they need to do to make sure that they're complying with all of the nuances that come from their spaces or programming. Right. Because for instance, the rec department needs to intersect with the programming requirements that DPH has for athletics. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is sort of the bent. But we go through the protocols, the workplace safety protocols is the next section after definition. Mm -hmm. And it's somewhat a regurgitation of the stuff that we've learned through the public eye about how we're supposed to be taking care of ourselves in the workplace and out. Um, it does, we go over social distancing guidelines, um, facility considerations about particularly where we're having items delivered because we're all ordering from Amazon because <laughs> um, we need face masks. Um, and then we do go through a section where it says wellness and self-certification of symptoms. And that's for employees and visitors because we have an expectation to protect the employees, but also if we moving into a certain type of reopening phase, um, that expectation changes when we add visitors to the mix. So then we move into references. You'll start to see references as you get to page nine mm -hmm. for a self-certification form. So where employees actually certify that they're, that they're healthy and they haven't had a contact. Um, and that's Appendix A. Um, we have exposure guidance in Appendix C. We have leave and travel guidance in Appendix D. And so there, those are specific items that outline how we will handle employee questions and or employee requests or situations. And those are the key pieces of guidance that we need to push out to employees now because there have been a couple instances where we've had contacts and we need to refine how we're handling everyone's understanding of this. So this, this third area after leave and travel guidance, you'll see it says phase reopening and I'm hoping everybody can see my screen that is sitting in the audience. Um, basically we're working through our ability to, to connect with to connect with visitors as employees and still maintain health and public safety for everyone. Um, so I've identified, as I said before, residents are encouraged to use to utilize the town's website for online resources to conduct business. 
almost all of our business has been pushed out to the website. You can buy your transfer station sticker. You can register your dog. You can do, you can send us comments and questions. Um, you can find updated information about how we're going to handle certain activities and programming. So we, we recommend that everybody use that platform or give us a call and ask us if you have a question. We are working. We're just not open to the public because we're trying to limit that contact. But as I said a little bit earlier, there are sections like emergency services, elections, public works, recreation, South County Senior Center, Tilton Library. All those facilities and programming have specific guidelines. And so the department has no best how they need to handle their spaces. So what, I will, what I'm going to ask, and I, a couple of months ago, I sent them an email and said, hey, think about this. Um, but I didn't really have a good refined idea of how we were gonna do this. So in this section, the page that I'm looking at is page 10. It basically says that these specific areas need to address the specific guidance and concerns that go with their programming or service. And so they will provide, I will ask them to provide their plan in an appendix that we will attach. Um, particularly library and senior center because they do have specific protocols and concerns. You have the elderly population rotates through those two facilities for programming. And so there's, there have been concerns throughout my CEO call about how to handle that. And I looked on the governor's website and there's some guidance that's just been posted for libraries. So I think we can expect to hear from Candace once, she once I tell her that I have a draft that I want everybody to address. Um, and, so, and, then, and so then I break down phases and I break them down as A, B, C, D, E. Phase A, and we're really in phase A at this point, it's just not formalized. Most staff are returned to work either in staggered spaces or at staggered hours. And that's really dependent on the workflow and what the situation is in the office because we still have to maintain the occupancy rates that the governor has identified as required. Um, we then have phase B, which are town facilities reopened for appointments only. And at this point, actively with certain programming like, or certain requirements like licensing and permits, we have started following this type of a guidance idea. So if someone needs to pick something up and they need to actually speak to somebody, we meet them at a specific time. I know the town clerk's been doing this for specific things like swearing someone in or marriage intentions because the state requirements maintain that you have to have a physical interaction. You have to see somebody signing something or taking an oath. So it, it really falls down to our phase right now is between B and, and it's between A and B, but for specific things that we have statutory requirements, we had to make adjustments so that we could meet people safely so that we could take in paperwork or facilitate them getting through paperwork that's official. And then phase C is, I'm sorry, phase, C, phase B is open for appointments only. And um, this piece, we still have to maintain all our safety protocols. Curbside services should still be utilized. So if we're leaving documents for someone to come pick up or sign that we don't have to have a contact, that's what, that's what we can do. Phase C is when we would open with reduced hours and limited capacity. And I have some information to flesh into that that I found very late today. Um, and then phase D would be when we open with regular hours, but under specific safety protocols. And phase E is open to the public with no restrictions. And so following the governor's guidelines, we're nowhere near being in the last two phases of this, even phase three. Um, and then the next section is additional information. And so I've created links for people to use once this is published to get to other information, general information, gathering information, travel information that's been published through, the, through DPH or through the governor's office, citing specific information. The next section 
is appendices. And so we have the employee self-certification form. We have instructional videos. So one of the things about reopening, one of those requirements is making sure that people have access to training so they know they're properly handling things. And there, one of my colleagues mentioned, hey, there's videos out there. And it is an allowable practice to ask people to watch the videos and just confirm that they watched them and then monitor to make sure everything is being cleaned and disinfected properly. And this will become very apparent when we open for early voting, which happens later this week. Um, Appendix C, and so this is, these are, Appendix C is a key piece of information that I need the board to address because this is the one that includes guidelines for leave due to exposure, illness, or childcare. And the scope of that, the purpose is to mitigate the issues we're all running into. Um, the scope of it is it applies to all town employees that don't have a conflict or a collective bargaining agreement. Um, and it outlines contact with employees and reporting to work. So we outline how we're gonna handle somebody calling in and saying, hey, I had an exposure or, hey, I've tested positive. How do we handle that? Um, so we refine that and say, an employee is instructed to contact me, the town administrator, who will consult with the board of health agent or other health personnel and determine how to handle a contact issue where someone thinks they've been exposed. Um, and then we have to decide how we're gonna deal with that, how testing and that sort of thing. And that follows the MDPH protocol. Then, we have to create the leave arrangement. So if someone's tested positive, but can work remotely, then we can put that into place if we have the ability to do that, which we, at this point, are building our, our um, resources to do that. So we're investing in um, technology so that we can create that. Um, if there's an issue where you have an employee who has to stay home for childcare, this appendix, Appendix C, de defines that. Um, then we have work from home requests. If somebody doesn't feel safe in the workplace, how are we going to handle that? Um, so if that per if a person requires or requests a remote work uh, accommodation, then we can say, okay, these are the reasons we would give an accommodation. An employee tests positive. An employee comes in close to contact with somebody who's infected. An employee um, comes in contact with someone who may have had a, a distant contact, so a third party contact. Um, an employee who's required to stay at home because of school or a school, school or daycare issues. Um, or an employee who's required to provide care for a family member. So this section gives you a reason for the request, and then it tells you how we're gonna handle it. And so in this case, an approval or disapproval would be, employees are not guaranteed requests for remote work, as certain positions cannot be performed remotely. Um, so we will, the town administrator can work, can refer to the job duties, work with the supervisor and determine how to make an accommodation. Um, also, employees may not be granted permission to remote work, late, work to remote work, if if there's an if there's something that need, needs to be done and that's safe to that for that person to be in um and then requirements for working remotely we define what that looks like so you have to maintain contact with your supervisor or the town administrator you have to complete your assignments. you have to meet all your deadlines and notify us if there's an issue and then if that person's unable to perform the work, then we have to go back and figure out how we make adjustments. And then we also mentioned flexible work hours, which we had mentioned in a, in a previous policy, because flexing time at home to deal with, with other issues can be a useful way to make sure that tasks are still getting completed. And so what we say here is an employee can start work early reduce a lunch schedule or work late. But we also say that flex time shall not result in overtime, that employee schedules shall not be adjusted to begin earlier than seven or later than six. And we could change that time. It's actually highlighted in case we wanted to change that time. 
Um, but we also create a request to do that flexible work option so that we can track and keep records in case the auditors have a question or in case there are other questions that come up. Um, we mentioned the fact that we need to be able to make reasonable accommodations. And this is similar to how we would make reasonable accommodations for an ADA request. Um, so to the, the extent that employees require an accommodation, they can file a request and we'll review it. Um, we'll try to, that needs to be an interactive process. So how can we adjust what you're doing so that you can work remotely? Are there training modules that you can take so that you can be working remotely and maintaining what your qualifications would be or what necessary, necessary training you may not have performed um, the last week or so, but if we could fit it into that schedule and, and give an allowance or an accommodation, that makes it easier for everybody to get the work done because some of these trainings you have to complete. I know there's a lot of highway trainings that are required over a period of time that the training modules themselves have switched to a remote uh, access platform. Like today I had a training module for procurement and they've moved everything to a remote platform, but it's an, still an all day thing. So those types of accommodations we outline. Uh, we also refine some of the understanding around the family's first coronavirus response act leave because there's still questions about that. Um, and we address the telecommute, traveling and telecommuting measures, any return to work issues that may need to be addressed after somebody comes back from a flex work schedule or for another reason. And then we actually hit hygiene rules when you're at home because it's important to remember that we need to practice those at home as well as at work. So a Appendix D is also the out-of-state travel policy. This is the next one that we needed to address because we're in vacation season and people are traveling. Hang on, Casey. And so Casey. refining this makes it easier for employees to can understand what the that? expectation is. And it also allows us a guidance document that we can quickly refer to and say, okay, Here's what you need to do. If you Can have you hear us? Let's work that out as an employer, manager, supervisor, and the employee. Can you so hear us at all? In this, in this section, we have <laughs> the purpose, the scope. Uh, we actually mentioned the same thing that the governor did. There's lower risk states to go to that may, um, uh, that may make it easier for someone to travel just to get away for a few days because goodness knows we need a break. Um, and then we reiterate the stay at home requirements for employees who return from a lower state or exceptions for stay at home requirements. If there's necessary, you know, if you've got somebody who comes back from a lower risk state, then we might not have an issue. Um, we address if somebody has been to a high risk state, how we're going to handle that. And since it happened to me once, I think it makes it easier if everybody can just refer to this. And then the rest of these appendices, so Appendix E is the vacation request form. Um, and I think I'm missing one appendix, which is was referenced a little bit earlier. But you see the gist of it as I'm scrolling through is that it's really to provide guidance to the employees and to pro provide guidance to the supervisors as to how we're gonna handle these things. Because this continues to be something that we're in a, in a pattern of, of hold on, we're not sure what's going to go on, especially if we're worried about any uptick that might happen in the fall. So having these policies in place that we can measurably change if necessary, but that gives us leeway for interpretation, but a guidance document really it is a good place for us all to be. Is that, does that make sense? We can't tell you. There we go. <laughs> She can't. She put us on mute. You can't hear us. We can't hear us because you put us on mute. I, I the host would like you to remove your microphone. There we go. Well, you can press star um, six. And I also want to remind people that, that. Um, the whole time you are that the town hall can you has been closed, yet? our expectations have been that people um, take extra precautions and that they protect each other in the work situation and at home. So we've been asking our employees all along to do extra behavior 
and have extra limitations on them. And this is our opportunity to formalize that because um, we actually just don't have a choice. We have, we're you know, moving along now and we need to have it formalized. I know you had a Trevor, a question, oh, Trevor, sorry. No, that's okay. We were on mute, so uh, Dave actually had a question. The, uh, just for point of interest, on the Family First uh, with that 80 hours, that's for a calendar year. That's not for each incident, right? It's for a calendar year, yes. Okay, I think we have to spell that out because some people are going to interpret okay. it per incident. So that's a good thing for me to make an adjustment on. I will... Um, I don't have the Word document in front of me, but I can make that adjustment. Okay. They know it's already been tried. Uh, in, in yes, the, and that's... That's in the private industry, but not in the town, so... Okay. Um, yes, it is in a calendar year, and the reason I know that is because I had a question about it myself. Okay. So... But yeah, I, as we were going through, like I said, I had a pretty busy day. Um, so, <clears throat> I have one so if I clarify that it, it's in a calendar year, does that satisfy the question? Yes. That yeah. I could make a change? Yeah, for me. Okay. So, and the vacation thing, uh, when people go away on vacation, say they want to head down to Florida for two weeks, um, when they come back, they can't come into, they may not be able to do their job Say they drive a plow truck, it's in the middle of summer, I mean, middle of winter. Um, they can't really work from remote, so um, it, it would make sense not to go away to Florida. We're not going to deny somebody that, but when you come back, you can't come back to work for 14 days, so that's really a month off. And um, they aren't, obviously aren't getting paid for those two weeks. Or they use, and so this is the thing, they can choose to use their own time if they have it Correct. to do that quarantine. Yep. And one thing, and so that's what we were trying to do is identify, identify solutions so people, we don't have to answer the question 15 times. Right. But yes, when you go away and come back, um, in order to get back into the workplace right now, if I understand it correctly, we have to have, a, you have to have a COVID-19 negative test. Yep. And then you can come back because that's the state travel advisory. I would say we would need to follow that anyway. Agreed. We've identified. Yeah. And then if you do come back from a hot spot, you need to understand that if you cannot work remotely, and there are a few things you can do sure. to assist with the work remote for certain disciplines or certain departments, there's training things that can be done. But you also have to accept the fact that if you make that choice, that you may have to use more of your time than you wanted to. Right. I just want to make sure it's clear that employees, if they decide to take off and go to a hotspot or somewhere that's not in the state's requirement, that um, you know they don't get to go on vacation for two weeks and then come home and sit home and get paid for two weeks. That's not how it works. So I just want to make sure that that's yeah, completely so clear. <laughs> In Appendix D, we say that in the re-entry into the workplace section, before re-entering the workplace after the 14-day stay-at-home period, such employees may be required to submit a COVID-19 test, have his, her temperature read, and or answer questions designed to determine whether he or she is experiencing COVID-19 symptoms. Yeah. Okay. So employees returning to the Commonwealth in the, the section above that in this Appendix D, Yep. Um, that's what it I'm says reading. we have to produce a test, a negative test, and that's the same. Like I said, that's the same requirement that the governor has. Right. Exactly. Um, that's perfect. I mean, if they can come back and produce a test that they're negative, that's fine. Um, it's just you need a little bit of time from that travel and the negative test, right? right. Am I right about that? Yeah. Like a day or two or Three something. Three to five days. Yeah. So you come. Or back. you? I think the guy. So Carolyn, can I ask Maybe a question? Carolyn could I think the answer guy that. says. You have to produce a negative COVID test within 72 hours yes. of entering the state. Um, Casey, what's really important here is the incubation period is on the average five days. So we, we do not want to test before five to seven days. So if a person is coming from Florida, they're going to have to be, uh, and they took an airplane, then 
they are going to have to wait to get a negative COVID test five to seven days from the time that they flew back into Massachusetts. Right. Because otherwise those tests are not worth it. You're not getting an accurate so um, opportunity. It seems like an Appendix D under Section 5, we would need to kind of add a bulletin, and maybe it's here somewhere, where um, we would need a test taken um, no sooner than five days, and then right, um, and then it and it, and then we'd have to ha get that test within 72 hours of taking that test. So, um, just so we know. what it appears to be the standard is five to seven days. So for yeah. us, no sooner than five to seven days. Right. Is what the window? Yeah. So maybe if we um, add that, we want to put in. So no sooner than five to seven days upon return to the state. Yes. Upon the last potential exposure. So if you were flying in, you want to count from the time you landed five to seven days out. If you drove your car and you drove straight and you only got gas, I, I suppose, you know, you could do it from a little bit earlier. Left. But, I mean, I wouldn't want to know what the circumstances are, I guess, in that case. Yeah. To make sure that they have a legitimate test. Yeah. I mean, there's still potential to get, I mean, that's how it's spread in the Berkshires is people, you know, stopping and getting gas coming up from New York City. And, Little tip, wear you know, a glove every else. time you get gas. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay. So maybe we could just add that. Um, but I think this is really good. Maybe I add that reference in, in Section 5, the yes. exceptions to stay at home. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So in reality, Hawaii really isn't an exempt state because it's very difficult to get from there to here without being in an airplane. True. Right, and you usually have, and you usually are not going to get a direct flight. So even if it was you were coming from Hawaii, you stopped off somewhere in a hot spot. Yeah. So uh, that doesn't count. I mean, you can't do that. Right. The thing okay. we all have to remember is we can't we can't um, countermand the governor's orders. No, I agree, but I think that's what. He, that's what yeah. we're to them. <laughs> I'm not. I'm speaking, can we figure out a way to handle that? Yes, but you know, I think most people are thinking very carefully about whether they go on vacation and where they go. I know right. I was. Yeah, I just need people to. Right. Yeah. I mean, right now, if you go up into Vermont, nobody seems to have a problem. But if you're you know, going to Rhode Island, there's obviously different situations. Even though you're just going over the border in both cases. Mm -hmm. Maine, I think Maine and New Hampshire require a COVID test right now. And yeah, Maine, Maine, does. Maine does. Yeah, I know that's that. How we're, that's how um, we got reported, you know, people that weren't sick um, got reported back to us because the test was required. So I'm... They were asymptomatic. I'm really happy with the work you've done on this. It uh, um, it seems pretty thorough and um, and you know, I had a lot of help. Yeah, well, that's that's what <laughs> it's all about. There is one section what that needs a change to it, and it's um, I I need to make the change that we just talked about. Yep. Reference the fact that the Family First Coronavirus Act can only be used once. Um, and then, and then under, I just noticed that under appendix, that, under appendix C, um, I'm not sure which it's under flexible, just after flexible hours at the top of the pay, it says flex time, uh, no way removes working hours from the town. Um, it only allows the town administrator the right to shift hours at, it says his, but put, just put his or her, um, just a typo kind of thing. Oh, I That's see. That's all. Just, just. Include his or her. Yep. Okay. I think that's it. Um, I mean, Casey's really done a, a, a huge lift on Yeah. This. No, it's great. This is very complete. I feel very satisfied with it. Yep. So very I, professionally I, I, done. Thank Jim Malloy. Jim yes. Malloy thank helped. you, Jim. And, and Kate. <laughs> and so did Jennifer. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> this wasn't something done in a vacuum. And well, so did good. Dick. I have to say, Dick has read this three times. I kept handing it to him and he kept rolling his eyes at me because, you know, he, I tried to pull this together and 
give him sections to look at, and then I give him the whole thing, and so he's, but he's, he said the same thing. He thought it was pretty comprehensive. Okay, good. Um, but if you, if you don't believe me, call him and ask him. Um, so if we... There is one section that I wanted to make an adjustment to, so I wonder, is the board ready to talk about actually approving this, or do you want to wait? I, I'm, I'm okay to move forward. I just, um, what, I guess what I want to know is who makes the decision on what phase we're in, and then, um, you know, okay. what the so layout. Okay, so that I think is the Board of Health decision okay. about what phase you're in. Mm -hmm. And so if you go back to the, to the middle of the document where yep. it says um, phase reopening, it's item C in phase reopening. Yep, I see. Let me tell you how we're working. So phase B of our phase reopening is really what we're doing right now. And there is a, there's some information in phase B that I would like to add. Okay. Um, and this is the problem with working at home is I couldn't see all my documents. Yep. <laughs> but essentially what we're doing is we will reopen to the public by appointment only. Mm -hmm. With the exception of the library and the senior center because they have unique things. Yeah. Um, building is a little tougher. Our construction permitting requirements that the state has promulgated since day one means that there has to be an intersect either over the phone, on, you know, FaceTime or Skype, or outside with proper social distancing um, to handle construction issues mm -hmm. or septic issues. So effectively, we're in phase B. Right. We're doing this. Mm -hmm. And so I would say um, the board would need to address it. So there was a change I wanted to make in this. So I would say the board would need to understand, okay, this is what we're physically doing. Um, and phase B, similar to how the governor does it, if the board were to accept the reopening plan and ask the chair to approve the phase B section change that I want to make after I send it out to everybody, um, then the board would pick that phase and just formalize it. So mm -hmm. by formalizing the entire plan and identifying that right now we're in phase B by appointment only. Right. This is what we're gonna. This is how we're going to do things. Mm -hmm. You're gonna call the offices. You're gonna set up an appointment. If there's documentation that we can't push out to you online or yeah. via email then we will leave it in the foyer and you can pick it up at a specific time. Right. If there's for instance, when we get a drop off for FedEx or something, that goes to a specific place. So we tell people, leave your documents in the foyer or put it in the drop box. Right. Because as you noted, the drop box, we have the big drop box now. Yep. Um, and we had been taking applications like that. There are certain documents that you can't take electronically. And so right. we yep. sort of made that accommodation without formalizing it. So I would ask the board to approve this contingent to a phase B uh, modification just to show a couple more details that I realized I didn't have in this version and definitely address the travel policies and the guidelines for employment mm -hmm. for benefits use and such in the right. appendices and would the board consider having the chair do the approval of the final language for that phase B description after I send it out to all three members yes yep I'm good with that I'm okay with it Okay, so now that I made that all convoluted, would you guys be willing to vote it? Or yes. Yeah, I'm ready. What do you want me to do? I'm ready. I've read it. I think it, so, it's thorough. It's good, and we're you know we're slowly moving forward, and we're addressing people's needs as they need it by appointment. Um, the town hall, just to clarify, the town hall will be open during election hours only for voting really only. That's just, you know, the doors are open, but it's to come in and vote in person um, as required by law. But we're not open to come in and, and sit down and have a conversation unless you've called and made an appointment after this policy takes effect. You make an appointment and we'll have a space out open. People can be socially distanced. You know, there's cleaning. As you know, there's cleaning involved with all that stuff after people leave. Um, it's still a lot of work. Um, but as long as we, it is. you know, it's we're... And, and I, I have to be clear, Trevor, too. We need to have a log book. Whoever comes yes. into the town hall has got to sign in. Yeah. So we have the ability to trade. Absolutely. you got to be able to trace. That's what I'm missing, Carolyn. I, I have it drafted. I just 
was working in two different doctors. Okay. Yeah, I think it's, we have to have the ability to trace. Yep. So anybody that comes into the town hall has got to log in time. Yep. And and their contact information and when they log out. Yep. That's perfect. And so for early voting, that's a little bit different because we actually have that information. I talked to Barbara right. about this mm -hmm. um, yesterday. Okay. So when people are voting, they're they're telling us, okay, this is where I live. Yeah. Here, take my ballot. Right. So we know who that person is. But we need the phone numbers, Casey. Contact. We need phone numbers. Okay, because I actually, Pat has drafted a list for me to do that. Okay. Yeah, you need the contact information, whether they, you need their cell phone, you need their home phone, and their email. We have to have all that information if you come into the town hall. I think when That's I. That's required for contact tracing. When I went to dinner the other night, we did that. You know, uh, we went to a restaurant and they took yeah. our contact information, which was great. You know, in case they have an issue, they can reach out to us. So. Right. That's, and that's so I new, have that in my head. But yeah, I will that's a new reality. have to do that. Yep. Okay. Yep. That's a new reality. If you're coming in, that's what you got to do. Yep. And, and, and Barbara should be taking that information, even, or anybody, when everybody has an appointment. Yep. If you have an appointment with someone, they need to have that it's logbook filled out. Building. Okay. So when they every, come in the building, we need to right. do Every department head should have a logbook in their office for their appointment. And in Barbara's case, for the voting, you come in to vote, you gotta have all that information filled out before she gives you the ballot. All right, so for contact tracing, that's what I would add in the reopening for appointments only. I would add contact tracing yep. um, and right. identify what that looks like. It's gonna be your name, address, phone number, um, email if you have and it and the time you came in mm -hmm. the time that you right. came in yeah any anybody okay. that comes in has got to we've got to be able to contact them okay all right so i could make that adjustment send send out that change i would have kate look at it because yes. um i think we need to make sure that we're preserving employment rights mm -hmm. but also employee rights right um, but I would make the change in phase B to include the contact tracing and um, make that, re refine that, that top paragraph a little bit. But if the board's okay with it, this can be a start that I can send out to the department heads and say, okay, this is how the municipal office is, gon is gonna do it. Now, I already have received a couple of pieces of information from the rec director, and I'm pretty sure that the library director has some information she's waiting to submit. So we'll start to see an influx. But I think the emergency services, they have a different protocol. Mm -hmm. And right now, the services, we are still pushing services out to everybody. We made accommodations for the transfer station very early on, but contact for you know, other highway activities or other DPW activities could remain limited because I think that's what needs to happen so that we don't create a contact situation for the guys out there who are in construction season and need to be working. Yep. Okay. Okay. All right, so, so I'll make those motion? refinements. So, so I'll make a motion to approve the um, reopening um, plan and documents provided um, and, 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 and I make a motion to allow the chair to sign after um, the uh, amendments we talked about Casey's going to put in um, and then have it reviewed by us uh, the chair will sign when she's comfortable I'll second that uh, I will second that or, or yep. Dave, let Dave second it okay any any further discussion all those in favor Dave Wolfram aye Trevor McDaniel aye Carolyn Ness aye Thank you. Thank you so much for all your help on that. Thank you, everybody, for listening to me, Pat. You know, <laughs> no worries. Yeah, it's good. Talk. Casey, um, it was a huge amount of work, and I just want to thank you. You've been yeah. were wonderful, and you addressed all my concerns the mm -hmm. entire time. I, I want you to know it was a real effort. And so one thing I will say to the board is if something else comes up where we need to add an appendices that I think the select board slash board of health needs to vote, I will bring it to you. Great. Um, 
So let's see. So now that that's done, there were some uh, administrators, town administration list you had here, uh, some hemp stuff and yes. let's see. So we received three notifications from the Cannabis Control Commission that three growers, hemp growers have been approved. Now okay. hemp regulations are completely different from marijuana regulations. That is an agricultural use. Correct. So the guidelines for that are different. And I have to say, I'm not up on those guidelines right now. I hadn't really been paying it. It wasn't in the front of my head. Okay. So if you have any questions about that, I'd have to research it. Nope, these but are the three. these are permits that come through this, the Cannabis Control Commission. Yep, I've seen Then that. we have the refinement yeah. of Order 48, which is penalty provision for uh, non-allowable activities like fines for face masks and stuff. Okay, uh, order amending the administration of penalties. So this, these are things that the state has amended, correct? Yes, so okay. things the, government, the governor amended based on the situational evidence and the data changes. Okay. Um, because if you recall, he um, had, he pushed an order out and it, it must have been 48, he pushed the order out for um, finding people who aren't following the guidelines. Okay, yep. And he treats it like a, he treats it in a specific way. So, you know, I haven't had a chance to talk to Dick and John about this. It just came out, so I wanted to get it in, you know, in front of you guys. Okay. And yep. then the third thing that I have was the DESE DPH joint memo, and it came out today. Okay. Um, I just wanted to have it prior, so you have a few minutes to read it before you go to your school committee yeah, meeting. Yeah, I'll definitely do I'm that. Sure it'll be a, yeah, I'm sure it'll be, it'll come up. Okay. Um, then we had an item unanticipated. Okay. And that was something that Barbara referenced last week, um, but didn't have the language written because the regulation hadn't been finished by the legislature. So this is what they call the electioneering policy. Okay. And the electioneering policy <laughs> is basically, it, it provides the same allowances for early voting that we have in polling places. Early voting isn't considered, the space where you early vote isn't considered a polling place. So the legislature put into effect protections for those spaces to keep from influencing voters that are coming in to cast their ballot. Yep, it's just taking the normal stuff. You wanna stuff read and, through it? Yeah, I'll read it. I am just looking for it now. I'll read it so that people, <clears throat> people see it. So this is a Town of Deerfield Select Board policy regarding engineering, uh, excuse me, electioneering. <laughs> during early and absentee voting, whereas chapter 54, section 65 of the general laws of Massachusetts prohibits electioneering, uh, parentheses, the display or distribution of materials intended to influence the actions of voters, um, close parentheses, at or within 150 feet of the entrance of polling places at an election of federal, state, or local uh, officers whereas an increasing percentage of Deerfield voters are taking advantage of their right and opportunity to vote in person by absentee ballot or during the early voting period established by the legislature and come to the town offices at 8 Conway Street in order to obtain absentee ballots or cast early ballots, um, whereas such voters uh, should be given the same right and opportunity to cast or obtain ballots free of electioneering activity as, it, as is enjoyed by voters who cast their vote on the day of the election, whereas observance of the 150 foot rule established by chapter 54, section 65 at the town offices during in-person absentee voting or early voting period would not unduly restrict the ability of any person to display or distribute campaign messages to prospective voters approaching the town offices and whereas the select board has the care, custody, and control of the town offices at 8 Conway Street and the surrounding sidewalks uh, and may regulate activities thereon. Now, therefore, the select board adopts the following regulation for the period designated for in-person absentee voting and the state's early voting period. No poster, card, handbill, place card, picture, or circular intended to influence the action of the voter 
other than those expressly authorized by general law chapter 54 section 65 shall be posted exhibited circulated or distributed in the town clerk's office in the building where the town clerk's office is located on the walls thereof on the premises on which the town offices at 8 Conway Street stand within 150 feet of the building entrance door to uh, said town offices given under our hands this 19th day of August 2020. So I'll make that motion. I'll second it. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Dave Wolfram, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. I'm mute. Uh, Carolyn Ness, aye. Thank I'm you. sorry. I had to, I'm slow on muting. Okay. <laughs> We've got a copy here that I'll sign. Dave will sign. And then you can sign, Carolyn, when you come in. Okay. Yeah. And then, Trevor, I just need to make a comment. I need to correct a comment. When I went back and I reviewed the, um, the Cannabis Control Commission from their information that they sent i'm sorry i made a an error in my comment and that is that um these licenses are given out according to the growth and production of hemp for commercial and research purposes within the guidelines that have been promulgated by the ccc okay sorry i just want to clarify that <laughs> all right sounds good and then I think that's all I had to do, but I wanted to make sure we got through the electioneering because um, Barbara needs that by yep. Saturday. Yep, we're all set there. Um, anything else? Any public comment? Anybody uh, uh, online or anywhere would like to speak? Say anything to the select board? Address I think us? Greg Franceschi would like to talk to you. Oh, okay. He, so if you look in your um, public comment, you'll see that Greg sent a petition. <laughs> Where is he? I know, All Greg I see is flowers. flowers. Are those Greg, flowers are for there? us? He's on mute. He's going to be here in a second. The flowers are for you, Trevor. Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> they look beautiful. <laughs> I wanted to, um, to just report back on a couple of things. Obviously, you guys know that there's been a petition that's gotten circulated. Um, it was based on a letter that Erica, Erica Ross wrote that um, my wife Lisa sent around to people in you know a couple of different venues. I think Facebook probably and um, through you know email contacts. I did the same. So um, so far, 236 people have signed um, have signed the petition, and um, I've asked a few people to call in tonight and. Um, just voice there to use the phone option because mm -hmm. um, I think that there are several people that, especially older people, that don't know how to use Zoom, of including course. me. I have to get my son to help me every time, pretty much still. That's fine. So um, the first thing I would like to do is just um, ask if you could. Um, I tried to explain how to do it to Martha Aronstam, mm -hmm. and um, she asked Trevor if you would be willing to to just call her. Of course, to have her contact information. I I think and I do. She has that she she wanted to say as a grandmother and um, you know whatever mm -hmm. senior. Sure. So um, maybe that would be a good place to start. Yep, I can do that. Greg, I guess um, I I tried to call you twice today. Oh, just I'm to, sorry. I, I tried to call you twice. I, I um, you know, left a message with you on your cell phone. Okay. And I wanted to give, I wanted to give you an update, um, where we're at with what we're doing. Um, uh, there were testing is a huge element of being ready, and we do have availability of tests. We do have capacity in the county. It is available. However, everyone, and the turnaround is between 24 and 36 hours. However, every once in a while, there's, there's a reagent shortage, and we have no ability to monitor it. So this is, we're trying to work this out, because if you, you, we can't open the schools if we can't do the testing. And it's just, it's seemingly random, 
when the testing is shut down and you can't get tests, you know, turn around for like seven to 10 days, which are useless. I also wanted to make sure that you, so we're working on that. We've uh, sent letters to DPH um, from the whole county trying to sort that out and make that, um, make them aware that we have no ability as local boards to help and that testing is critical. The second thing is um, we, um, you know, are trying to communicate, we're trying to come up with a matrix where we have community-wide observation of what's happening and, and real-time um, case reporting. Lisa is our public health nurse for 15 other communities by herself, including Conway. Um, Waitley is trying to hire a public health and truthfully there's been no real communication with Sunderland. So we're trying to work that out. I have an extremely good working relationship with Greenfield and we have set up weekly calls uh, multiple times during the week to touch base. So I feel um, that's adequate. We do not have that relationship with Montague and we have several school choice students coming from Montague. So we're working on that. So I want you to know that we're taking this very seriously and we're doing everything we can to come up with, you know, the conditions that would allow the school to open. However, they're not going to place at this moment. How would the, you said testing? I'm not sure what that, who, who's, who would be tested? All of the kids? No, if you have a COVID, uh, suspicion of a COVID case, um, the parent would take the child to um, the community health center, the hospital. You would go to a primary care if they have a primary care doctor, get an order, get it done, um, you know, that kind of thing. But you have to have testing and tracing. We have tracing capacity um, to do that. And that's why, you know, we're very, um, I mean, it's very strict. We've been working on this since, well, for seven months now. So um, we feel fairly comfortable with the setup. It's just, it's not all in place at this point. I also just wanted to kind of hit on a couple of things that the, um, you know, the, the rollout is a lot different than it was yesterday, the day before that, the 12th when this was written. Um, you know, we're, we're all taking our time and doing our due diligence to make sure that everything is in place to be safe for the employees and the, and the children. And so, you know, to, we can't really, it's, it's hard to just look at one snapshot in time because everything changes constantly. I mean, I think if you hang on at seven o'clock, you'll hear another story that, you know, as it's changed since yesterday and the day before that. So just how we're rolling out, what we're doing, when the kids are coming back, how many, how long they're coming back for. Um, it, it's, you know, it's, it's a constant, you know, negotiation and um, a constant slog of trying to make sure that we have everything in place and people are, are secure and safe to go back, you know, to go back. Um, you know, based on science, and that's what I base this on all, all the time is the data and, and the science and where we're at at the moment and our capacity. Um, I feel comfortable getting going, but we still have, you know, a few things to lay out and we'll hear from administration tonight. And, um, you know, it's not to say that we won't change on a dime and, and it may be, I mean, from now until the time we go back to school, um, the kids actually show up back at the school it'll be a different plan then too, um, just because we learn every day and we change um, constantly to, to, to just err on the side of caution and make sure we're doing things right. So, um, we, so as, as Trevor and, said, it constantly changes. This is I mean, a 24 seven situation. We're putting in 50, 60 hours a week, trying to stay on top of it. Every day is different. And the, the um, I know there was concern that Desi guidelines were different than DPHs. We have always said that we were doing DPH guidelines mm -hmm. and, um, you know, the school was aware of that, um, or, you know, the front, um, Union 38 has been aware of it and supported that. Um, and we we've just had multiple discussions on the county level. So everyone is trying to be consistent. Um, the problem is it just, 
Greg, every day is different. And, and I mean, we're trying to do as best we can. Um, I mean, that's all I can say. We have new, new um, data from, from um, DESI, a joint memo again from DESI and the public health that came out yesterday. You know, a lot of, a lot of the discussion about, you know, people were concerned. They were like, well, I, I'd, I'd choose remote because I want to feel you know, safe and stay home, but I, I don't want to do that because I'm afraid I'm going to get stuck with this second-rate teacher. Um, that's really not the case. The same teacher is going to teach every kid. So your frontier, um, you know, whatever the, the classroom teacher, whoever's teaching the class is going to teach both the parents, I mean, both, both the kids that are in remote and the, and the kids that are actually in the school. So there's a lot that's evolving and changing over this time. And I think we, you know, let's just sit back and wait, wait a little bit. We'll see where we're at in a, f in a couple of weeks. Um, I think, I think we're moving in the right, right place. I can't see you're, you're muted, Greg. You're muted. You're muted, Greg. There sorry, you go. sorry, sorry. Yep. So, you guys probably saw this article mm -hmm. about Athol. Yeah. And the staff is um, there. Are, I guess. Um, three staff people and one teacher that have tested positive. Yep. And um, they haven't opened school yet, but when you say testing, will the, will the testing also include the teachers and the staff people that work at the school? They will before be- everybody, Before everybody, the kids come back? They'll be tested. No, it's not. Well, go, everyone, go ahead, every, every person, Greg, every day, people have to go through a checklist and, and, and you need to stay home, obviously, if you're sick. But if you're, and you're, you're asymptomatic or whatever the word is, then you would have no way of knowing until you were. No, it. that's right. We, we wouldn't know until someone is sick. That's true. They could already be spreading it by that time. That is absolutely true. Well, I mean, where I'm coming from is I just feel like, you know, I don't know if you guys have, remember the, the, in the 70s the phrase, the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle basically just says that you don't, you know, you don't, um, put a nuclear power plant in until you know that it's safe, you know, and um, with this, I feel like I, I felt last week, like, uh, you know, I was just, you know, bringing this up kind of in response to the school committee meeting. I hadn't talked to that many other people. Um, Erica had written this letter and Lisa sent the, um, the letter around, obviously, um, and the software that allows people to um, sign the petition also allows them to comment. So there are a few comments I guess I, I per, should probably read. Um, I can't see anything though, but um, I don't know all these people, but Molly Montgomery said, I care about the safety of this community. Maurice Hogue said, this is not the time to test the waters with children. It's being proven all over the country. Martha, I can't make it, her the last name didn't come through. They need to be remote. Sarah Churchill Windsor, not until it's safe. Luke Strzokowski, we have an obligation to support those that need it most. The safest way to do that is by keeping as many people out of the building as possible. Miranda Kuduki, I'm signing because although our plan has been and still is to work remotely this first semester, I guess you misunderstood that. Um, I feel outline explained to me initially is not to be the case, and I fear this could change again to a fully computerized learning platform. There is a lot at stake. I also need to convey that when administrators say plan for a shutdown at any point, what this really means is plan for kids to get sick with COVID. We don't know how many or how severe, but we're openly admitting anyone's child could become sick at some point. Greg, can I interrupt Thank you me. a second? Because I don't, we've got to yeah. get on to another meeting, so I don't have enough time for, for all the comments. But what I want, what I want to say is um, you always manage risk, right? So um, there's always an opportunity for somebody to be sick with many different infectious diseases. Um, the, the, the statistics we have right now in our, in our neck of the woods is that we are um, based on all the guidance, we should be back full time. Um, and and I, I don't feel comfortable back full time, although there's, there's a case to be said that I'd rather have our kids there full time than going out and coming back and going out and coming back. I would, I would probably rather everybody in one school, one building, and 
in that one cohort and not having to go to their grandmothers or you know, a group of kids and then come back to school. Um, that's not going to happen right now with the union we have and, and the issues we have going on right now. We also, on the other hand, are not going to keep our kids home for two or three years. Um, uh, I can guarantee in two years... In, no, Greg, let me finish, Greg, because I'm speaking. Greg, I'm speaking. So what I'm, what I'm saying is that we are never going to be at a better place in t for, for several years, because even if we get a, a vaccine in two or three months, which is a long shot, usually takes 10 years, um, many people are not going to be comfortable taking a vaccine that got rushed out that fast. And a vaccine that gets rushed out that fast may even be at, at, at best 80 percent uh, chance of, of making sure, like we, we get our flu vaccine every year. You're lucky if it's 80 percent good. So you're always going to have this virus in our community. And if we're lucky at, at this safe rate in our community, I'm not saying all over the country and all over the world. And certainly we still have cases that crop up here and there, but we will never be. Uh, I'm not finished, Greg. Greg, Greg, I'm not finished. You got to wait. Greg, you got to wait a moment. Just let me finish and then I'll let you speak. So we're never going to be 100% safe with this, with this COVID. Uh, it's just going to be here. And the way we have to manage is the risks and health we do mentally to the kids by not having them back and not teaching. There are many children and many families that I've spoken to that are just as passionate on the other side of the issue that you are, and they want and need their kids in front of their teacher for for education and for instruction. So we're trying to find that happy balance of making sure that, our, that we're taking all the safety precautions we can, we're, that we have fast contact tracing, fast testing in case we have an issue, just like we've treated all the cases we've had in Deerfield since the beginning. So I think our idea is to make sure that we have enough testing uh, and enough um, tracing available so that if, if a case does pop up we can make sure it's isolated and we can contact trace it like we've been doing um, and, and then also push out the education and we're, we're doing a better job of figuring out what that education model is and trying to make sure that all kids are being taught the same by the same teacher i'll finish there and i'll let you speak greg okay thank you thank you I appreciate everything that you guys are doing, and I uh, and I hear I hear you completely. I um, I just feel that um, this medium of Zoom, for one thing, is a, is an obstacle to your hearing people in the community. And um, the reason why I, I didn't even know after looking at the website and participating in Zoom meetings with a couple of different groups, and and also in the school committee meeting and the last select board meeting via Zoom that I had the option of calling because when I looked at the page it said it didn't even say the word dial or, or, or use your phone to call us. It was in a, a lingo that was specific to Zoom that I was confused by and I didn't understand that I could call in. So I thought I was being so clever tonight um, telling you know some of the, some friends of mine that maybe we could just call and you guys could answer the phone and you know talk to people and have, a, have it mic. Um, because obviously that technology exists and um, the more primitive form of it would be to just hold your microphone, your phone up to the microphone and you know, people could hear each other. But you've already got that worked out through the Zoom, but people in the community didn't know, some people don't know how to use that. And um, Martha Aronstam is one person. So um, there are probably are at least four or five people that I know of that want to call in now. And Martha wanted to ask, she asked if you would be willing to call her because she didn't know what to do with all those numbers and passcodes and all that stuff because she's not familiar with it. So would you be willing to do that? And well, I'm not calling her on the, in a meeting tonight, no, yeah, but I, I will reach out to her. To she I, has to call in. Yeah, I can reach out to her personally and I'll speak to her, but not through a meeting like this. It's, it's not how it works. But I, so, Greg, I've okay. had 250 people were on the school committee meeting the other night and I've probably got a hundred letters um and then all the people who signed this i know people are concerned it's not that i haven't heard what their concerns are i'm, I'm fully aware 
Um, and I have concerns, just as many on the other side, that want their kids back full time. So I'm just trying to find work with science and public health to make sure we're doing everything we can to find that good, happy medium to get our kids educated and get started back and then make sure that we are as, as nimble as we can if we have a case to address and that we are as nimble as we can be if we do have something show up, we can, we can, we can shut down, assess, and then move on um, and either close down and move fully remote or to stay, stay hybrid and come back. So as you see, you'll be on in a half hour and you can watch the, the, the school committee meeting and hear from the administration and local public health and uh, public health nurses to see where we're at. So, Greg, can I Greg if, all, if all the criteria have been met and, and we are able to open, it will be a day-to-day -day operation because the situation changes every day. So because we're opening one day doesn't mean that we'll be open the next day. It depends on, you know, if we have cases show up, if, it, if, there is, if we feel there's community spread, or if testing is no longer available, um, or return time. Because it, what it is, what it appears to be, is the reagent shortage. And there's no way for us to monitor that at the moment. So if you'd have the swab, you put your swab into the reagent and it's been sent out. So like I said, it seems like we have capacity. It seems like the testing is available. Um, and it's returning in 24 to 36 hours right now. However, randomly, all of a sudden there's um, no reagent and everything shuts down and it's stopped. In that situation, the school can't operate because then testing is no longer available. And that can happen, you know, just between three and four o'clock in the afternoon or, you know, sometime in the morning, whatever. The school then will be closed because testing is no longer available. We have no ability to test. So, I mean, there's so many moving parts. We have worked so many hours trying to build relationships, get the information, and be as safe as possible. Data will inform strategy. But people have to realize this is a day-to-day -day thing. Every day is a snow day call. We don't know what the situation will be from day to day. And when I say we're going to work on stuff, it's too early to inform whether the schools are going to open or not. And the reason why is because not everything is in place at this point. But we're still you know, a ways away from school opening. And that's not to say that it can't be worked out. Or not. I mean, there's every opportunity. Maybe we can't work it out to satisfactory level. It's very, very difficult for us as well. We absolutely want people to be safe. I am, that is the number one thing for me. I don't care how many people scream and yell at me. If, you know, I feel it's not safe, it's not safe, and I'm not going to support opening the school. I mean, that's just the way I feel. Um, so, but it's the data, and, and, and we, we don't have everything in place at the moment, but we're working very hard to try to do that, and um, we just don't know when the timeline is. I'm, I'm trying to be really honest and to tell you exactly what we have. There's been a lot of questions from parents. I didn't think that there was any requirement for testing for any teachers or students to go back into the school. No, there we're talking it. about if people are sick or they have symptoms or there's a, a, a contact. If, if, if um, a, say in a split household, um, you know, a student goes home to the father's household on a Tuesday night, and the, you find out that the father potentially has COVID or is a contact with COVID, then you would want to have that child tested. And it is you know, very hard to get tested. I mean, today we, we wanted to get tested. We had to go all the way to Chicopee and we had to wait like 90 minutes and we don't get our results back for five to, to seven to 10 days. So no. Is it, so is there Not testing no, no. The, in the county, there is testing yeah, available. Testing available. We, we had a meeting last week with the community health center. It's through your um, primary care. They do it at the hospital. Um, cool you get a referral from your doctor, right? So this, this is after somebody gets symptoms or is sick. So Correct. Still no, this is if you're, a, if you're a contact. 
if you're a contact. Right, right. But I mean, none of this gets triggered. People don't get tested until they know they were exposed to somebody with COVID or somebody gets sick. We, we, we do not, we're not just testing our whole community. That is true. Until that, we have you know, the next... The private school, so the, the private next, schools have the financial ability to do uh, testing all week. Every, you know, their student popu uh, day student population is going to get tested twice a week. Their staff are getting tested twice a week. Everyone's getting tested when they come back and, and the, start. The they other, have the ability to do testing in their community on a regular basis. The other, we're hoping mm. that we're going to get some kind of new test, the new test, the spit test, and if that's available in the next few weeks that's that coming on pretty quick because then everybody will be tested yeah it has to be economical and so, fast still there, there's a lot of time lag between testing and and getting your results and it isn't that easy to find a test i couldn't find anywhere where i didn't need a doctor referral and i wanted mm -hmm. to get one right away because i have symptoms and so i had to drive to chickabee today other other than that i would have to wait for my doctor to get around to returning my call and then that felt like it would take too long but the other public health concern, I, I understand children don't do recover from this, but I understand that teachers that are high risk won't have to go into the classroom. I understand there's the option to be remote. But what I wanted to speak about, and, and maybe this, there's another forum that would be more appropriate, is, is the public health issues of the, of the multi-generational households and the grandparents. I have a letter from Judy and John Rose, who were too shy to really talk today, but they're very, very concerned because they take care of their grandson. Mm -hmm. They pick him up from the Waitley Elementary School. They're both high risk. They're both in almost 80 years old. They, they represent a lot of different people. And to well, wait until there's an outbreak and they could potentially be exposed, well, he, there's just... Here's the other thing. There's so many more people affected by the school well, here's, opening than... Here's the, the other thing, Lisa. Lisa, so the other thing is that people have to really look at their own life and decide, um, should, I be taking, should I be picking up those kids? Should I be around them? You'd have to take some personal responsibility and understand, like, if, if I'm at high risk, I should not be picking up my grandchild, you know, or that, grandch or that family needs to decide if that's the only way that there's caregiver taken for this person, because the mom's got to go to work, uh, or dad's got to go to work, then there, there needs to be another, another way to either take care of that or they need to maybe have that child be remote. You know, there's decisions that people have to make personally about their personal, um, their personal exposure and their life circumstances, whether they should be having their kids come to school or they should be having an elderly grandparent picking up a child after they go to a, to a school. I mean, that probably isn't the the best way to move forward for that family, I'm thinking. If they're that concerned about their health and, and where that child's been, um, again, our caseload is very, very low in our community. So I think the, the odds of them, um, of the child contracting, you know, con get it, getting COVID and bringing it back to the family are, are fairly small. And that's what all the data is telling us right now. That's why they're saying it's okay to go back. But, um, but people have to kind of decide for themselves. Is that is that the best thing for our family? Do we, should we take a more insular approach and stay home more? Um, I mean, I've been in the community and I cover all of Western Massachusetts. I go to every single town. I've been working straight on through from day one on this stuff, but I also take a lot of precaution in what I do and where I am and who I'm seeing and always wearing this wherever I go. I've got hand sanitizer in the car. I wash my hands constantly. I'm, you know, I take care to make sure I'm gonna be safe. And, um, you know, we didn't see our grandparents or my parents for a very long time because we were concerned and my in-laws are, are, you know, can be um, susceptible. So we didn't want to see them for a long time, but we've gotten more comfortable. We know how to be safe around each other. I think the students are going to and the, and the teachers are going to understand what their limitations are and we're going to learn as we go. My fear is we cannot stay secluded in our house and not educating our kids for another couple years. It just isn't going to happen. We are the safest we are going to be or have been uh, for, for quite a long time. And if we see, it, see, see the, the indicators creeping up in our area, we're going to have to make that change. But there, I, I see, honestly, there is no way we're going to be at a 0% risk for a couple of years. And I don't think we will ever be. This thing is so ingrained in this, this community uh, this this nation 
Um, I, I put most of the blame at the current administration. They ignored this problem for so long. They let it go completely out of control to this day. Uh, they haven't set up the infrastructure for the testing that we need. Um, it's criminal. It's criminal what this administration has done. I, just my personal opinion, not a view of the town or the board, my personal opinion, I think it's criminal what they've done to this nation. And um, I hope we see a change. Um, but what we have to move forward with what we have. We cannot stay you know, insular for, for many years. I, I don't ever see this getting better. Um, it's going to be a long, long time before we're all safe again. Um, I don't think we ever will. Be. I, I think that at the very least, the Board of Health should hear from the school what their contact tracing plan is, because I've never gotten it. an answer about that. And it seems like they would really have to do some logistical planning. And then it, they have. it would be valuable to the community also they to have. Have. We they have. have. They, Lisa. they have. Okay. Yeah, we and have and we have. It just seems just so ironic that you guys are so careful about who comes into the town hall and the school committee meets remotely because they feel like it's yes. not safe to meet together yet. They think it's safe for well, it's hundreds not of that, kids Lisa. Teachers to be together in a building, like it's just the you're missing the point. Huge. So it's, maybe it's there could be easier. some communication about why there's a different standard for schools than there are for other. I towns. think I think you're missing the point, Lisa. It's not that we wouldn't meet. I mean, we, David's here. We've meet. We've met many times. We'll have people in the room. We'll meet. It's easier to meet online. So you know, if you don't have to go into a room with you know 20 people and meet why would you i mean it's so much easier to put it on on you know we've learned a lot from this people can stay at home and work easier we can do meetings distantly and remotely we don't all have to be in the same room just you know and we're we just voted tonight on a reopening plan for this for the town because we're slowly opening that up for people to come in by appointment only as they need and to be open for elections so I think it's time to start moving forward. We understand where we're at now, and we need to just look at um, how we need to operate as a town and, and take baby steps forward to get, to get moving um, and, to, and to understand how we're going to live with this virus for several years to come. And I, think, um, I, I don't think we can be secluded forever, and I think people still should make a personal decision on their own. Do they feel it's safe enough to bring their kids into a school or to walk into a restaurant or to go to, beach, go to the beach? I mean, people are all on vacation. They're you know, going to restaurants. Or, you know, everybody's kind of going out and doing their thing. When we get to school, everyone's like, oh, no, we don't want to go there. So, I mean, there's, you, I think you can do it safely smartly and if you feel like your family it's not good enough for you you don't feel safe enough then you should stay home i mean that's i think people need to p take personal responsibility yeah. about where they're at i understand that but but the other thing is that the schools reopening will increase community spread and i disagree with the logic that it's going to be here for years so we have to just deal with it there's so much unknown about this virus every Every week we learn more about how it spreads, yeah. how it affects people. So, and and, there, and the vaccination could exist in, in you know, next year, in a couple months, in the spring. So we will, it will be getting better. And I think, but I, what are the metrics? We can learn remote. I'm not talking about people not learning. So I'm just, well, I know, you know, it's it's, well, it's, a, it's hopeless. I know that they they have to, they want to, they're, they're all hell bent on going in person. But it's just to me, it's so predictable that within a few weeks there's going to be cases, increased cases, people are going to get sick, some people might die. May, so may or may not, I don't think so. I'm just trying to advocate for the people who now, who are alive, who won't be, might not be alive again in, in a month. Well, we hear you. Two months or whatever. We hear you, and thank you for can advocating. I, can I ask, can I, we're going to move on. something? Yep, one last so thing, and we're going to, we've got to move on. i got to get ready for my next meeting. Okay, so there, there will be a bunch of people trying to call in with various information, um, and and you know opinions um but i just looked up the results in italy and in italy back in the beginning of all this six thousand a day now less than 500 and the reason is because italy took it very seriously from the very beginning as have many other countries our country yeah. did not do that yep. and our leadership has been saying it's okay it's okay it's okay and obviously it's not we have 170,000 people that have been exposed right so died or that have died, died. Sorry, that have died. millions who exposed. knows how many million that have been exposed 22 so million what we're doing we're gambling with our our community and our children's lives and i don't think that it's necessary that we gamble it at all and i think that the sooner we stop gambling 
the sooner we'll solve the problem, because the problem will only be solved when everyone is in unison saying that, saying that they understand that it's their personal responsibility to do all these things. And when you know people are all wearing masks, they have mask ordinances, you can't even walk through the center of Northampton and Amherst anymore without a mask, which I think is a good idea. Yeah. But, you know, we don't want to do it because we're American and we think we can just get away with whatever we want. We can have whatever we want. And I definitely want my kid back in school, but I know I can't have it now. Okay. So I'll keep him out if I have to. That's fine. But then I'm depriving him of access to, you know, what everybody else has got for the short period of time that they will have it. But most likely they're going to have to close the schools. And if we're not testing the staff and teachers, we're going to have the same results that AFOL has which isn't even opened yet. I mean, Apple already has four people, four staff people that are exposing each other, you know, and other people in the building to what they have. And it okay. just doesn't make sense to me. All right, thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Lisa. Any other comments on the line? We've got to, I've got to get off for our next meeting. So, um, but I do want to allow anybody else who wants to speak or call in, have a uh, comment. And then it's certainly you're welcome to call into the school committee meeting. That'll be starting at, at uh, 7 o'clock. If there are no other public comments, um, I would make a motion to just... Um, bear with me one second here. I'll make that motion to adjourn, Trevor. Well, we're going we're gonna to recess. We're gonna make a, could you make a motion to recess and reconvene at the school committee meeting? I make a motion to um, uh, recess. Uh, recess to um, and then reopen at the school committee meeting. And then we will adjourn and upon adjourn and we will yeah. we will adjourn upon completion of the school committee meeting. Um, I'll second are that. are Thank you? you Dave. Are we? How are we connecting to the school committee meeting? So. So uh, before we close out the vote, so what you would do is um, you could sign on, uh, uh, you know, personally on your device. If, if you, again, if you go to the easiest way to sign up on Zoom is to go to the uh, Town of Deerfield Elementary School page. You'll see the meeting agenda okay. there. Once you open up the agenda, it's usually a PDF file. You just click on that link for the Zoom meeting and you will get in. It may be on Google, uh, excuse me, the school vote uh, meets on Google Meet instead of Zoom, so it's a different app, but it's Google. Okay. So if you're using a Google browser, okay. Chrome, or something, you'll still be able to get in. So. Um, I think Victoria. I think Victoria was going to sign in. So. Yeah, that'd be great. And as long as um, you're there, it will be okay. Yeah, I told uh, talked to Darius today. I said that you may be on. I know Meg Birch is going to be there. I've watched Frontiers last night and Waitley's the other night. And um, so I'm, I'm familiar with what Meg is talking about. And so she'll be going through a lot of the stuff that you all have been working with her on and all the other school nurses. So it'd be great if you're there and wanted to, you know, chime in here and there. Okay. Okay, great. So, um, so we've got that uh, motion to recess and reconvene at the school committee meeting at 7 p.m. And we'll adjourn after the school committee meeting. I'll second that. All those in favor? I, Trevor McDaniel. I, Carolyn Ness. Great. Thank you, Carolyn.